Alul starts chapter 4 discussing how the technique of the state evolved over time, commenting on how administrative technique did not yet exist at the start of the 20th century. Since relative context still existed, it prevented experimentations and efficiency from occurring. Now, the eventual conjunction of the state with technique to Alul is the most important historical phenomenon to mankind. It's something we still cannot see or accept for ourselves. This new technical framework is far different from any traditional framework, as we've since discussed. Technique of this nature took off when it was embraced by individuals who were outside state influence. Now, when the state noted the efficiency produced by this among masses of men, it immediately became interested. Thus, there was a transition from private to public, developing technique concerning itself with the collectivity of man from then onwards. Now, as in the case of atomic energy, as technique evolves, it requires a large organized system, like an authoritarian uh, state, to keep it under control, especially in terms of monetary costs. So as previously discussed, when a new technique emerges in one context, most commonly the economic one, it must spread to all others, and those contexts must accommodate so as to further generate efficiency. Now, the state's role is to simply intervene according to the plan so as to allow technique to flourish and develop further, thus developing the nation state, driven mostly on economic means. Thus, all contexts are by extension shaped by this economic context. To quote Alul, the problem of the adaptation of society to economy is a technical problem. Thus, Alul talks about several techniques which can be used to adapt society to the economy through state intervention. These techniques are both private and public. So individual techniques represent individual inspirations and enthusiasms, which tend to display more imagination at finding individual solutions to individual problems. Oppositely, the state acts not as an individual, but as the masses of men collectively, focusing on multiple problems. As such, unlike the individual, it has difficulty finding the technique needed for a solution. Thus, the techniques of individuals tend to yield better outputs, especially when we consider how the individual is financially constrained, and thus must be more efficient so as to waste less resources he has at his limited disposal. This is the economy of means, which is ultimately the characteristic of true technique to Alul. When we add in capitalistic competition to this equation, it only accelerates efficiency itself. Individual techniques are also typically specialized or in the hands of specialists. So think of some uh, really well-known inventors like your Tesla uh, or, or Edison, despite what you think of them. Those would be good examples of these people. And they typically produce very advanced techniques, which rarely slackened in pace, uh, transformed into industrial enterprises for the sake generally of producing uh, profit, especially in Edison's case. So it was the individual and not the state that could implement such precise techniques during that time. Now, once these private techniques reach the public sphere, they are basically amalgamated into the state, causing it to evolve as the technical phenomenon itself isn't modified when it passes under state control. Now, Alul uh, cites uh, Simoneville, uh, who, because of this fact, basically showed uh, why a rational system of industry could only make the workers' conditions worse instead of evolving into socialism. So if the state attempts to modify technical rules established, it always suffers a setback. To transition the economy to state control only creates state capitalism and not socialism, since socialism implies the suppression of the state, right? So the state will adopt a technique suited for efficiency always. Thus, the socialist state, since it is efficient, it wants to be efficient, it adopts the technical principles of capitalism itself. So the USSR, for example, still persisted in keeping profits or surplus value from its workers, right, alienating them in the Marxist sense. Only instead of going to companies, of course, the excess profit was dumped back into the state itself. So with this merger of technique uh, with the state, we see an evolution occur. Since the technique of the individual served individual needs and thus functioned on a smaller scale, how does it apply to larger scale state interests? Well, the state must uh, develop basically identical principles of technical organization to be efficient. And if they don't, they'll be taken over by private enterprise. So as such, a, a new organization of administration basically occurs through the creation of administrative techniques and by introducing machines into organizations, which basically free up time for further efficiency. Machines do a lot of the paperwork. So the state's pretty good at doing this, except in terms, of course, the law.
uh, which is traditional in scope, lost in languages, and of which functions uh, inefficiently, since it is not evolved in uh, relation to other social institutes. So a good example of the state implementing new techniques um, though would be in terms of, say, schooling. Um, schooling is very good because it integrates constantly new technical discoveries into itself, um, thus showing how the traditional technique of the state are then modified by these private techniques. Um, causing the whole system to painfully restructure itself, right? So anytime a new technique is involved in any context, it is amalgamated into it. This causes all the other contexts to have to adjust themselves to become more efficient in relation to this technique. So it throws the system out of whack for a bit, but then um, everything gets amalgamated into it and it gets more and more efficient. So the state as a whole functions basically as this giant technical organism, which is composed of various uh, subsidiary techniques, complex mechanisms, and specialized methods. So the state needs technique to exist, and technique needs the state to survive. So they need each other. To, it's symbiosis, a symbiotic relationship that really cannot be shaken between the two. So a man who's at the center of such a structure, um, he really has no more control over it than the man lost in the machinery. Uh, itself. So we're all lost to technique, and this technique is growing more and more complex, which is a sum, basically, the technique is a sum of all technical advancements of our modern age, so it's immensely complex. Thus the conflict between the technicians now and the politicians who are losing their place of power. Uh, there's less and less room for these politicians. So to Alul, this is not actually a conflict between politicians necessarily and technicians, but it's a conflict between technicians of different categories in this sense. So the U.S. does well in splitting up political technicians from actual politicians. So the technician simply report the pros and cons of his findings, and he lets the politician basically decide the best course of action. But since the technical findings are generally always correct, the politician really has no choice but to accept the technical solutions offered to him. Uh, so he, he really doesn't have a matter. Um, if he goes against the matter, he's most likely going to be wrong, and he's going to be ridiculed for that, and he'll probably be thrown out of office. So, so many of these decisions and calculations even aren't, aren't even made by men. Uh, but mostly by machines, um, as seen uh, in the case of General uh, MacArthur's expulsion um, by the electronic brain uh, EAC. Um, I guess it was known as the Washington Oracle. <laughs> um, but either way, the, the politician becomes less and less important unless they try and uh, back the system, which would cause a crisis of adaptation, uh, to use Alul's uh, wording. So corruption can also be key. Um, which can arrest technical takeover. So politicians can obviously make the wrong choice. They can go against the technical uh, choice, try to maybe back a humanistic uh, slogan or ideology or something like that. That can slow the system down. Corruption can also slow the system down when they pursue more private uh, interests as opposed to general interests in following technique. So typically, public opinion sides with technical interests. And this is, this is a really important concept, but... As such, when adhering to technical decision becomes a matter of personal interest. Um, the state is thus transformed by this predominance of technicians who have no need to trust or swear allegiance basically to anything else but their own instruments of measurement, uh, which function on efficiencies, right? So the technician, he has no allegiance to anything. He doesn't have allegiance to politicians. He doesn't have allegiance to, to people. He doesn't have allegiance to anything except the scientific instrument, which he is using to conduct his measurements and measure and uh, his results, which he can produce, and produces more efficiency. So the nation becomes the object of the technical state to Alul. So it's a machine that exploits the means of a nation for its optimum economic yield, uh, suppressing any human ideological or moral barriers that might impede upon technical progress. So a technique of planning is thus implemented for the sake of efficiency, adopted by all systems that seek to be efficient even if it goes against their own ideals. So this technical necessity makes everything rather similar in its structure, and nations are, are really becoming closely connected because of this, right? Everything is functioning on efficiency, and everything ends up looking the same um, at some point. So everything is becoming more and more like technique basically reigns supreme because it corresponds to social necessity, and thus no one can reject the most efficient means in the face of limited resources and the fact that problems are becoming more complicated to solve than ever because the system itself is becoming more complicated um, than ever before. So there's simply no more choice to be made in the matter when living in a technical society but to embrace this sense of efficiency.
Because of this, the most efficient solution found must be assimilated and adhered to at all times. Furthermore, while the state cannot alter technique, technique alters the state, creating an aristocracy of technicians, as we've discussed. And basically everyone else in the system is just a function uh, or a servant or a slave to this. So technique thus shapes an aristocratic society, which basically shapes an aristocratic government, which is concealed from the public through propaganda. And we talked about this kind of the secret society it creates. Thus, it's often in so-called democratic societies that propaganda is commonly most proliferated. Uh, we see propaganda most often in democracies uh, more than anywhere else because it's, it's just a necessity. You have to tell the people, yes, you are free, you are liberated, when in fact they are not. They are all slaves to this uh, aristocratic system. So either way, it's technique that structures the state. Now, we have lobbyists, right? We have corporate groups, uh, groups rather all have representation in Washington, as we're all familiar with. Um, it's not just the state that technique affects, but political policies, too, are then affected by this. So Lulu goes into ideological doctrine here, but if, if ideological doctrine coincides with state techniques, then they are accepted, right? If it, if it matches what the, the efficient output of the state and it matches the techniques that are needed, it will be accepted. But humanist doctrines, right, that are not adapted to the social reality of technique and efficiency in producing the optimum yield, they are outright denied. So technique renders uh, traditional democratic and humanistic doctrines basically obsolete. So this is now a, a natural part of our technical evolution to a little. We're shifting from political doctrines of justice to automated technical efficiencies and facts. So the political doctrines of today are solely used to rationalize and justify the state in its actions towards technique. It's all they're used for. Um, it's really foolish to allude to assume ideological political doctrines based on a politician's say opinions uh, will ever become ends in and of themselves um, since they've been overtaken by technique. So the power of technique, of course, can't be applied without a semblance of justification occurring. You have to explain to the people why you're doing uh, these things. You can't just say efficiency and technique. Um, and so this is, really becomes the politician's role. So the politician simply plays their part in justifying techniques so its power can be applied. So the state, in a sense, it, it thus becomes really totalitarian at this point, not in the traditional sense, like of any like human uh, totalitarian theories, but in the sense that all is basically driven towards technique and efficiency, and thus uh, everything is just essentially reduced to the same thing. It has to become this one thing. It has to be driven towards technique and efficiency. And if it's not, it's outcast. Um, so we see it kind of in this totalitarian sense or this dictator, uh, dictatorial uh, role that basically the state has to play in order to enforce this. So uh, there are differences uh, that may exist between democracies and dictatorships, um, but technique is still to a little, it's that common straw that connects the two together. So they're not as, as, as different as we like to think. Alul compares communism and fascism, and despite their difference, it does the same thing, having a comparable attitude towards that of technique. Uh, Marxism, right? We talked about Marxism itself, as we discussed. It ties its very fate to technique itself, which is just using us. Uh, you know, we said technique and the Marxism is going to liberate uh, uh, the working class, but it, it not. It makes their lives worse. Going back to Simone wheels, we said it just continually makes their lives worse. So in either case, uh, state sovereignty reigns supreme, always tied to technique. So the dictatorial state functions on efficiency. It gives itself over to it to attain the maximum profit or yield. Uh, communism, to Alul, was more suited to, um, it was more suited people still to this day, if you have to pick between communism or not, Nazism, you would pick communism. And it suited that way because it never uh, it had the veneer, the false veneer of humanism behind it. And that false veneer of humanism and communism kind of allowed people to still hold on to some of their illusions and hopes in humanity, even though this whole system was uh, going on in the shadows of pure efficiency and output and technique. Uh, but it still allowed them to, to hold on to those hopes. So both were still working towards systems, though, of total exploitation um, driven towards technique. So now justice follows basically the same problems as we talked about with political doctrine. So are we talking about actual justice here or just those of judicial technique, which are two different things? So injustice, we can talk about this. So the problem is that 
you can't transform justice into technical elements to a rule since it cannot be grasped or fixed, right? Um, nor is it in service of, of the state. So justice itself, it's a very abstract term. It's not in service of the state at all. In fact, right, just the opposite. Law can actually judge the state or bring the state uh, up on charges and things like that. So way too much power, right? We, we can't have this in a system of efficiency. It ruins efficiency. So it needs to be more subservient. Well, how do we do that? Well, so there's an equilibrium that's established between justice and judicial technique, which uh, uses means through legal decisions to produce efficientness, uh, effectiveness, I'm sorry, and efficiency. So judicial technique um, is of the creation of law and to do so that it does not become lost in you know, empty language or as Alul states, uh, another verbalism. Um, in other words, it, it's an to get people to adhere to a legal attitude, displaying a sense of obedience, he uses the term obedience here, which produces efficiency. So obedience to the law or a rule is thus fundamental, right? Because that can produce efficiency in people. So this obedience is artificial though and not natural as it's dictated by mechanisms which adjust behavior to rule. So we're seeing this, this artificial uh, form through mechanisms replace the, the, the natural. And we're getting now into the difference between justice um, and ju uh, judicial techniques, which has embraced the law. And the law enforces obedience upon people to make them more efficient, obviously. So thus, because of this, we need a technician though, right? We need a technician to apply law mechanically and in a machine-like manner, uh, deducing consequences and he needs to find out solutions immediately for the sake of, 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 of efficiency. Um, so kind of like a, a judge dread uh, type of, of person, right? He gets stuff done. But of course, as we'll learn, we don't even need the, the brutality, um, uh, the uh, overt force that judge dread displays. Um, it's much more covert. In fact, people will keep themselves under control. So, so man essentially will need to do away with any abstraction um, or humanistic sense of what justice is um, to what it's supposed to be, right? We have this very vague notion, oh, justice, and we have these humanitarian values. That, that all needs to go away. So in order for such things um, to be implemented and to erase that sense of uncertainty, because uncertainty ultimately is inefficient. Uh, if we're constantly questioning things uh, and everything is unknown, people can't function. You need efficiency, you need certainty in order to function smoothly. So order and security must be maintained, even if these means um, may be unjust. So order and security outweigh any sense of justice in this sense. Um, in order, law and police become identical since the law is nothing but an instrument of the state, inhumanely functioning on efficiency. So the police get involved and we can use that to adhere to, um, get people to adhere to the law in order to function more efficiently. Now, once the consciousness of society subordinates itself to this technique and it becomes normalized, right? It becomes normalized behavior over time. People keep themselves under control. And that's just a covert means of controlling people. Um, you have a police state or something like that at that point where you know you're going to keep yourself in check because if you don't, someone's going to be there to arrest you. Um, so you're going to really internalize this and obey things without need of excessive force. Um, it's just going to be internalized. Uh, remember, Alul, we talked about norms. It's just going to be another norm at that point. You're going to keep yourself under control. So mechanisms, of course, will be set in place to guarantee its passive acceptance. So law uh, basically ensures order instead of justice. Justice itself, we see, is being replaced by law and order. So with this, the distinction between political technique and judicial technique dissolves into pure technical application, which accounts for every contingency so it functions efficiently, acting as an instrument to the state until it disappears into it so that the state becomes a law unto itself recognizing no rules but its own. In other words, order equals efficiency at that point, and the state only answers to itself. So once function becomes technical, geared on efficient technique, it validates itself, and one can't even call it into question. Um, in other words, if something's functioning really, really well, you don't have to justify it. You're like, everything's you know flowing smoothly. What are you talking about? Everything's going great. 
um, even though you know it, it may not be like we're, we're stripping away levels of humanity. Uh, people are being exploited more and more by this technique. But hey, everything's going functioning smoothly. Everything's going great. So you can't even call it into question. It's it's that it's that deeply embedded. Um, it's that it's that even subconscious uh, in a sense. It's that covert. So law becomes nothing more than a method to a rule, and it represents the triumph of technique itself. So as technique continues to shape the state, so too does technique evolve and adapt, right? Technique's always changing. So man is noting this change, but not to the extent that he should. Uh, he's hanging on to a false optimistic hope for his own future. We're still kind of hanging on to that, oh, it could work out in the end for us. Um, you know, it's all going to work out. We're in that spellbound state of where technique's going to help us. Um, people still believe in, in technique to this, this day, and they think if technique um, does something wrong, it's just because it's misapplied by the state. But it's technique itself. It's this alien kind of entity and it's exploiting us for its own purposes. So uh, noting how there is nothing to offset technique anymore, it's too difficult a truth for most to take. So they kind of lie to themselves at this point, and there's nothing we can really do about technique. How do you offset something that's so complicated? We have this very intensely complicated multifaceted uh, organism essentially functioning and how do you stop this thing how do you stop this thing that is constantly incorporating new techniques every day and constantly adjusting and evolving and adapting while people's are people are still essentially lost in the ideologies of the 19th century conversely right so it's it's very very uh, pessimistic to 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 a viewpoint but how do people overcome this basically they can't so Either way, every factor um, is functionally incorporated into the technical framework. So morality and public opinion um, side with technique, for man loves the advancement of machines. So the higher and faster the performance, the more satisfied men become, uh, fused in a mob mentality that basically worships technique itself. We love breaking barriers through technique and we love technology, we love science, we love these things. Um, and as I said, you know, if they're misused, we think they're misused by humans, but there's nothing wrong with the technique itself, even though it is the technique itself that um, is exploiting us. So people also reject typically the humanities. We see this in our own society. People laugh like, oh, you got a humanities degree, you got a degree in philosophy um, or something like that. You should have got a STEM degree. We see this and people aren't even aware of it themselves or what they're doing, but we reject humanities um, since they're not seen as being as serious as technical pursuits in our society. And it's because we live in this technological society itself that we have that um, viewpoint and mentality. Um, and even if the public were to turn against technique to a little um, by some miracle, he doesn't, it's not very probable, but even if they were to turn against the technique, propaganda would still be used to persuade them uh, back to its side, right? The state would definitely not allow people to completely abandon technique because everything is is reliant upon it. The state is reliant upon technique and technique is reliant upon the state. So the modern world is dominated by economics, is in turn, it's dominated by technique as well, which the social structure basically accepts. So traditional societies focused on human need have been basically replaced with modern societies of technical necessity enforced by the state and all for the point of profit and progress. So thus technique has no obstacle to keep it in check. Uh, what's most frightening to Alul is how independent technique is, uh, placing man in this utter peril. Uh, you know, we're at the mercy, literally his words, we're at the mercy of alien powers. <laughs> so even he relates the technique to an alien uh, entity in some way. It's an alien power and we can't control it. So even scientific research is stifled um, if it doesn't produce something that will lead to further progress. So the state and corporations will only fund, we know this, right? They'll only fund academic institutes who go to MIT. You see all sorts of corporations involved there, although they've transitioned from um, technological ones to biological ones because biology is is really the field that's taking off now but you see all these major corporations there and they're they're there to fund uh, academic institutes and research because they know they're going to pull in a profit from it from these new technologies coming out of it from these new advancements and they're going to turn a profit from it so everything kind of uh, falls victim to service and utility um alul is similar to the nazis um zek uh, i'm going to butcher this word but Zweck Wissenschaft, um, Zweck Wissenschaft, um, which is basically just means the practical or purposeful uh, sciences. 
So it's only sciences that are used for technical means. Like if you, if you want to develop uh, or you want research for a science, well, what's it going to, is it going to make money? Is it going to make profit for us? If not, you're not, we're not getting funding. And we basically have that now essentially, which is kind of sad, but it's very similar to, um, to that Nazi, um, ideology of the, the science, the practical sciences. So we're progressing steadily along this path where technique becomes stronger as it accelerates through the state and where the state and technique work together and each essentially reinforces the other only to grow stronger with time. So we're kind of, we're kind of left there. Um, but that's basically chapter four of the technological society. I kind of throw, uh, thought to make a longer video on this, just kind of condense it all there. It's all really wrapped together nicely. It's a longer chapter. Chapter five is another longer chapter as well. Um, so I'm not sure if I'll do one video on chapter five as well, or if I'll break that up into to different topics, but this kind of took all those different topics and kind of melded them all together really nicely. So I wanted to make one uh, solid video on it. So that is it. We are going to start the fifth chapter in our next video. And then uh, we're almost actually done with the technological society because the fifth chapter is about, I think a hundred pages. And then chapter six is only like five pages. It's like a little essay. Um, he wrote a book, man would be in the year 2000. So we are almost there with the technological society. Um, but that's it for this video. And I'll talk to you guys later. Bye.